Saul and Paul. Two names for the same person. But wow, what a contrast. What a contrast between these two. Saul, his, his Hebrew name, Saul is this aggressive, assertive, angry, vicious persecutor of the followers of Jesus. Why? Where does he get all this? What's it, what's he, where is he coming from? Well, Saul's background was that of a Hebrew, a Jew. Saul was a Pharisee. If you had run into him or he ran into you on a city street, he might have a thing, few things to say to you. I'll use one example. Has anybody here ever run a stop sign with a car? There's a few. Let me put it this way. Has anybody here ever rolled through a stop sign with a car? Now that, that softens it a little bit. It's a little easier for us to fess up on that one. Of course. When we roll through a stop sign, our, our tires never quite stop rolling. And maybe we don't consider it running a stop sign, but if Saul were on that street corner, he'd be sitting there watching your tires. And if your tires didn't stop completely, he'd say, all right, you just ran a stop sign. Here's your, here's your ticket, and you're fine for running the stop sign. Pay it. Saul knew every law of the Hebrews. He knew every law of Scripture. He was intent on following those laws himself. And he was intent on making sure that everybody else did too. He was not going to tolerate someone not obeying the laws. So if Saul were standing on the corner and saw you roll through a stop sign, he'd say, you didn't stop. Stop means stop. And he'd hand you the ticket. And with that coming from Saul, we would have gotten off very, very easy. Saul knew all the laws of Scripture, all the laws that the church the Hebrews at that time had put together, and he was going to be enforcing them. Jesus had already been crucified and had been raised by the time Saul was persecuting the followers of Jesus. But Saul knew the stories of what Jesus had done. Saul knew that, that Jesus raised a man from the dead on the Sabbath. Jesus Je Saul knew that Jesus had, had healed an individual. Jesus had forgiven sins, and Saul knew that that wasn't right. Jesus and his followers had been walking through a grain field on a Sabbath. They were hungry, so they grabbed hold of some heads of wheat, threshed it out in their hand, popped the grains in their mouth, and the Pharisees went wild. You're harvesting on a Sabbath. That's illegal. That's wrong. Jesus had gone and visited with a Samaritan woman at a well. Two strikes against Jesus there. First off, Jews and Samaritans didn't talk to one another. And another, a man didn't walk up to a strange woman and begin talking to her. Saul knew that Jesus' followers didn't see anything wrong with those kinds of things. And he was intent on eliminating this group of people that were called the way, followers of Jesus, and making sure that the laws of the synagogue, the Hebrew laws, the laws of Scripture, were all followed just exactly. And in doing that, he was vicious. He was intent on killing and persecuting those who were following. Jesus the Christ. That example from, from Acts of Saul, the young man Saul, standing with the, the coats at his feet of the people who were stoning Stephen, and he was approving of what was going on. That's one instance of what Saul was doing. He also managed to somehow or another get, get uh, letters of introduction, letters of permission, so that he could go to Damascus and there, if he found any followers of Jesus, he could arrest them and throw them in prison. 
This guy was focused. This guy was really focused and concentrating on eliminating this group of followers of Jesus Christ. What he didn't see coming was that on that road to Damascus, he had a vision of Jesus Christ himself. And in that vision, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And it was then that Paul became, Saul became a follower of Jesus. Saul and Paul. Same person. Saul was accustomed to living in two different worlds. Saul was his Hebrew name. He was a Hebrew. But his father was a Roman. A Roman citizen. And so by birth, Saul had Roman citizenship. He was both Hebrew and Roman. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman name. And when Paul started to tell people about Jesus, and as he was writing to the Romans, he used his Roman name, Paul. And that's how we know him. Changed name because of what he was saying and to whom he was speaking. Saul had been vicious, vicious and aggressive and intent on wiping out the, the followers of Jesus. Saul became Paul. Paul was the one who was intent on proclaiming this message of salvation through Christ at all expense. What a contrast between those two lives for that man. What a contrast from persecutor to eventually we see him persecuted himself. Because of his faith, because of his proclamation of the gospel, Saul was thrown out of one city, laughed out of another, nearly stoned in one and left for dead. He had to be smuggled out of another city, all because he was now proclaiming Christ. And in doing so, he would not quit. And yet he knew what he was up against. I mean, this was Rome that he was writing to. Rome. It was a city that was built on, a, an empire that was built on successful wars. And he was writing to tell them about the power of God. He was writing to the Romans who believed that their Caesar, their emperor was God. And so he was writing to say, mm, no, that's not God. Here is God. He was writing to a city that had dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of unknown gods. And he was saying, nope, here is the one true God. He was writing to a city that was loaded with intellectuals, philosophers, poets, politicians, businessmen. And to that group, he was writing to tell them about the power of God for self. Remarkable confidence that this man, Paul, had. He sums it up very well in that 17th verse of the 16th and 17th verse of that first chapter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Martin Luther discovered that passage. Maybe in some ways we could say that that, dis that passage discovered Martin Luther. Martin Luther heard that passage and the scriptures just flew wide open for him. He discovered through that passage that there isn't anything we can do it's what God does for us. Faith and trust in the power of God. We can't make ourselves righteous, right with God. 
It's God who sets us straight. It's God who sets us right. And it's our faith and our trust in Him that allows that rightness of God to be recognized in our lives. So what do you know about faith? Anybody experienced faith in the last 24 hours? Have you expressed it? Have you lived it? How many of you turned on a light switch this morning? You live by faith. The light switch is in our house. Walk over to them, flip them. 99.9% .9 of the time, the light comes right on. Really quite simple. We learn to trust it. That little flip of the switch provides something in, in my home that I can't make. All I can do is have faith that when I flip that switch, it works. Anybody, anybody crawled into an airplane lately? The moment you step into that airplane, you have taken a step of faith. You're having faith in the pilot who's in the, in the cockpit, the flight crew that's in that plane, and everyone who has had their hands on that plane to make sure that it's functional and ready for you to fly from one place to another. You are living by faith the moment you step into an airplane. Anybody talked with a doctor lately and been told you need to have surgery to correct that? And the moment you say okay to surgery, you have taken a step of faith. You are living by faith. You're saying, yes, the doctor can do for me what I can't do for myself. If you've had any need for a lawyer to argue your case, to present your evidence, you have put your hands, put yourself in that lawyer's hands, and you have said, I have faith and trust in you that you will accomplish what is best for me. Well, we are men, women, and children of faith. We are men, women, and children of faith in ways far deeper than light switches and lawyers and doctors, and pilots. Think of your own prayers. Think of your own prayers. Have you prayed lately that God would be gracious and merciful to you because of something you've done and would forgive you? That's an act of faith. We don't ask someone to do something unless we're confident that they can do it. And so as we pray to God and have asked for him to intervene in our lives and to forgive us, it's an act of faith. Have you prayed to God on behalf of someone else for their recovery from surgery, for comfort for them because of the loss of a family member or, or the resolution of a conflict in their lives? Then you have taken a step of faith. You have said, God, please do this because I can't do it, but I know you can. When we take those steps of faith, we recognize the power of God in our lives and in the lives of others. And we unleash that power. We ask for that power to be used and shared because we know we are powerless. And maybe that's where we have the toughest part in living out our faith. We are so accustomed to being the ones to flip the switch, to take the step onto the airplane, to hire the lawyer, to make decisions, and to take action. But we are powerless when it comes to release from our sins. We are powerless in the face of death. We are powerless in the face of conflicts with Satan himself. And that doesn't always sit well with us. We want to be the ones in control. We want to have the sense of security that we can do this. The letter of Paul to the Romans is written to us. We are confident in our intellect. We are confident in our philosophy. We are confident in our laws. We are confident in our lives. But Paul writes to us to say, there is a power far greater than you, and God himself loves you 
beyond your wildest imaginations. Paul writes, he loves you so much that he has sent his own son to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He redeems you, brings you back from the grave. He heals your wounds. He heals your soul and gives you life as only he can give. All it is, is a step of faith. And even that gift of faith is a gift from God. The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies us because we can't do any of it. Oh, this Paul is an, is an amazing person. Prolific writer. Aggressive, assertive, at one time a persecutor, and became the persecuted. But in doing so, he brings the message to us, the message of the power of God for salvation. And he boldly says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And neither should we be. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your servant, Paul, for the way in which you met him, confronted him, challenged him, changed him, guarded him, protected him, and sent him. We thank you for his words written, inspired by you, that we might read them. Grant that we might recognize your hand in all that is written. We pray that we might be nurtured by his words, by your words and that we might recognize your power. Lord, use our hands, our feet, and our voices to tell that message as Paul did, that we might not be ashamed of the gospel.